So today's extra lesson is on electrochemical reactions. This is the first in two lessons on this section where today's is on spontaneous reactions which form part of what we call galvanic cells. So the very simple idea here is that we look at chemical reactions as an exchange of electrons. So we've always known that uh, through bonding, uh, certain molecules or compounds are formed and broken. So what we're now going to look at is, is exactly how those electrons are exchanged. And then later on, what we try to do is we try to harness that change of electrons or as an electron moves. And we say, well, we can use that as electrical energy. So the concept starts out fairly simply, where we say, in our traditional form, we would have had some kind of chemical reaction that starts out with magnesium chloride, or sorry, magnesium and zinc chloride that then react and that then goes to form zinc and magnesium chloride. This is often referred to as an ion exchange reaction. So if we look at this reaction and try to see what's happened with each of these agents, what we find is that magnesium starts out neutral, meaning that it has the same number of protons and electrons. At the same time, we know that this over here, zinc chloride, is formed by an ionic bond. An ionic bond is formed when uh, one of the elements becomes positively charged, the other becomes negatively charged, and then because they are opposite charges, they are attracted to each other and therefore stick together. So in this case, we can see because chlorine is in group 17 on the periodic table, chlorine is the one that actually becomes negatively charged, and zinc over here is positively charged. Now because there are two chlorine, we can see that the entire charge of this molecule is still zero. Because although zinc is positively charged, chlorine is negatively charged, so the total number of protons and electrons is equal. Yeah. Now what happens here, if we go to the second part of the reaction, our products, we now see that all of a sudden, zinc has become neutral. And at the same time, since chlorine remains unchanged, what that must mean is that magnesium has become positively charged. Right? And the only way that this can happen, we know that this cannot possibly happen through a transfer of protons because that would change the type of element. The only way that this can happen is through a transfer of electrons. And so what we can do here is we can see that the electrons must have gone from magnesium, which started out neutral, to zinc, which ended up being neutral. The reason why we can see this is because zinc starts out positive and ends neutral, which means it must have gained two electrons. And the only place that it could have gained those two electrons from is from magnesium, because magnesium goes from starting with a neutral charge and ending with a charge of plus two. So essentially what we're doing in this section is we're looking at chemical reactions as an exchange of electrons. We're saying this reaction happened because magnesium was willing or able or forced to give its electrons away to zinc. And then zinc took those electrons and therefore a change in our reactants and products took place. So what we actually see here is that there are two reactions that took place. There are two reactions that took place. The first one was the process of magnesium giving away electrons. Right? Magnesium went from being a neutral magnesium atom to being a positively charged magnesium ion, which means that it must have given away two electrons in the process. The second part, or the second reaction that happened here, was the reaction of zinc, where zinc started out as a positively charged ion. It then went and gained two electrons in order to become a zinc atom. Now, these are often referred to as half reactions. The reason why they are referred to as half reactions is because it cannot happen on its own. Right? Magnesium cannot give away two electrons if zinc is not there to accept those two electrons. Right? In the same way, as a random person, David, for example, wouldn't be able to give away a birthday present if he didn't have any friends, right? So magnesium is trying to give away electrons 
but it can only do that because there is somebody nearby willing to accept those electrons. So we call these half reactions because you need two half reactions in order for a whole reaction to take place. We name these half reactions. We name the one that gives away electrons an oxidation half reaction. Oxidation half reaction is defined in two ways. It can be defined in terms of oxidation number, which is very closely linked to the charge of an atom or an element, but we don't spend too much time discussing oxidation number because you can far easier do it by just looking at electrons. But it is important to know both definitions, where the most common one is, in terms of electron transfer, oxidation is a loss of electrons. Whenever something loses electrons, it is oxidized, or we say it undergoes oxidation. So in this case, we would say that magnesium was oxidized. At the same time, we have zinc that, as we said, is a half reaction that needs to happen with that oxidation. The only way that magnesium can give away electrons is if zinc is nearby and can accept those electrons. And we call that a reduction half reaction. Reduction half reaction here defined as a gain of electrons. So we say that magnesium is oxidized while zinc is reduced. This is often combined and we call these redox reactions simply because re reduction and oxidation must happen together. An easy way to remember this is with the device oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons and re reduction is gain. So oxidation is a loss of electrons and reduction is a gain. Right, so by looking at any chemical reaction, looking at essentially looking at their charge before and after the reaction, we can determine who has gained and who has lost electrons. Just keep in mind here that electrons are negatively charged. Therefore, by losing electrons, you become positively charged. The next part is very simply just um, a bit of terminology. Once we understand what oxidation is and what reduction is, it is important to understand what an oxidizing agent is and what a reducing agent is. So, the oxidizing agent is the thing that makes oxidation possible. So, we know here that magnesium wants to be oxidized. Magnesium wants to give away electrons. But it cannot do that until there is somebody or something there that is able to accept that electron. The only thing that can accept magnesium's electrons is the zinc ions. So what we say is we say that oxidation is possible, magnesium is able to be oxidized because zinc ions are present. So we say the zinc ions are then the oxidizing agents. They are the things that make oxidation possible. Very important here, when you are asked to write down the formula or the name of the oxidizing agent, there is a very big difference between writing zinc ions, Zn2+, and zinc. Right? Because this zinc as it is here does not want to be reduced. It has already been reduced and therefore is not an oxidizing agent. It is always going to be what is on the left of your reduction half reaction. In the same way, we can say that zinc ions want to be reduced. They want to gain electrons. They can only gain electrons if somebody is willing to give away electrons. That somebody, in this case, is magnesium. It's the magnesium atom that is starting out this reaction with its electrons and willing to give them away that is able to make this reduction possible. And so since this is enabling reduction, we say this is the reducing agent. But, so those two are fairly simple. Oxidizing agent is the substance that is reduced or gains electrons, where the reducing agent is the substance that is oxidized or loses electrons. Now, at this point, it becomes clear that there are plenty of half reactions that are possible. 
pretty much everything on the periodic table is able to either be oxidized or reduced. So what we have is we have something called the table of standard reduction potential. This table essentially lists all of the possible half reactions that, that we are going to come across. It is not all of the possible half reactions on Earth. It is just all the possible half reactions that we encounter on a daily basis. Right, so this table looks like this. Um, important to note here that this table can be presented in two forms. Um, often, or in the NSC syllabus, it's represented as table 4A or 4B, where table 4A is the inverse of table 4B. Um, I prefer to use table 4B that has lithium on the top. The reason for that is because if you read or if you use table 4B, it is in order of increasing oxidizing ability or increasing ability to be reduced. Sorry, decreasing ability to be reduced. Right? So I'm going to be working on table 4B for the rest of this um, video. And what we are doing here is we are looking at this table and trying to decide which reactions occur over other reactions. So the first thing to notice on this table is that everything on this table is written as a reversible reaction. I'm taking the first reaction here. Lithium ions can gain an electron in order to become lithium. Written as a reversible reaction. So, what we should hopefully see here is that when this reaction is read in the forward direction, that is reduction. Starts out with lithium ions, gaining an electron, and so reading from left to right is always going to be our reduction half reach. So, that then tells us that reading from right to left, we start out with lithium, we see that lithium then gives away its electron, and so therefore this is our oxidation half reach. Very important here, when you are asked to write down the oxidation half reaction for lithium in this case, it must be written as a one directional reaction. Right? Because you've been asked to show lithium being oxidized, you must only show lithium being oxidized. If you're asked to show lithium being reduced, then you only show lithium being reduced. You never put the reversible reaction sign in when you are showing uh, one specific direction of that reaction. So, once we understand that the layout of this table is always read from left to right for reduction half reactions, right to left for oxidation half reactions, we need to understand the reason why they are laid out in exactly this order. For that, what we need to do is we need to look at the arrows on either side of this table. So, on the left hand side, there's an arrow that reads increasing oxidizing ability. Down the right hand side, increasing oxidizing ability. What most people think that this means is it means that it is more likely to be oxidized the further it goes down the table. Because anyone who speaks English thinks that's how you would read this. Now unfortunately, you'd be wrong. Increasing oxidizing ability actually refers to its ability to be an oxidizing agent which means that this technically should be read as increasing ability to be reduced or increasing oxidizing agent ability. Either way, what you should see this as is right at the bottom of the table is fluorine, which is most easily reduced, meaning that since fluorine is a halogen in group 17, it is looking for that one extra electron to complete its valence energy limit. And so fluorine, right at the bottom of the table, is the one that is most desperate to accept an electron. In the same way as lithium, right at the top of the table, is the one that is most willing to give away an electron. The reason why this is important is because we, we can now define our reactions or pick our reactions so that they would occur spontaneously. We can choose our reactions in such a way that we have something that is willing to be oxidized, something that is willing to give away its electrons, 
and something that is willing to accept its electrons, which makes this a spontaneous reaction. We can do that by always ensuring that the oxidation half reaction occurs or appears above the reduction half reaction on table 4B. What this says is it says that by putting it in this arrangement where we make this letter C, we are always making sure that the thing that is most easily oxidized is able to give away its electrons to something that is most easily reduced. So we pick the thing that is higher up on the table so that we know that that is willing to give away its electrons while the thing at the bottom is willing to accept its electrons. Now using this, you can pick any random spontaneous reaction you want. You can say, I want a reaction between sodium and tin. And you find these on the table and you find that sodium is higher up on the table, which means that sodium is going to be oxidized. Sodium is going to be read from right to left here, and sodium is going to be the one to give away its electrons. Tin, appearing further down on the table, is therefore more easily reduced, and so therefore tin, with its valency of 2, is going to accept those electrons from sodium. And so here, we have written down a spontaneous reaction. We know that it is spontaneous, because we have chosen our oxidation half reaction so that it is more willing to give away electrons than tin, and tin is more willing to accept electrons than sodium. So to determine a spontaneous reaction, we always do it in this order so that we can find a flow of, di flow of electrons without having to channel that flow ourselves with the battery. Right, so the reason why this is useful is because we can now once we've created a flow of electrons, as we have in this case, where we've created a flow of electrons from sodium to tin, what we can now do is we can decide to move those electrons through an external circuit. By moving them through an external circuit, we are creating a flow of current, we are creating a flow of charge, and therefore we have created a battery. So essentially what this whole section is about is it's about using chemicals to convert from that chemical energy into electrical energy that we can use elsewhere. So we do that in the following way. We start with a couple of definitions. The first thing is that an electrode is any electrical conductor used to make contact with a non-metallic part of the circuit. Right? Because in these circuits, we are always going to set it up in two separate containers. Each of those containers is going to contain a liquid, and those two containers are going to be joined by a wire that we are hoping to get current to flow through in our external circuit. Now the only way that we can reliably connect that liquid to the wire is with something called an electrode, that is a metal conductor that is going to allow for the flow of electrons either from the liquid to the electrode or from the electrode to the liquid. Right, then, next thing for us that's important is to define each electrode. So we're always going to call the electrode where oxidation takes place the anode. Do you remember that? An ox anode oxidation, and the electrode where reduction takes place as red fat. Reduction occurs at the cathode. The next thing that's important for us is something called an electrolyte. An electrolyte is the liquid solution that is either going to be oxidized or reduced because it carries ions within it. So the electrolyte, a substance of which the aqueous solution contains ions. And then finally, we call this a galvanic cell because it converts chemical energy into electrical energy, right? We start with lithium and fluorine uh, in their chemical form and we convert it into something useful for our cells, right? That being electrical energy. So the example that we're going to be look at, looking at is zinc and copper, a cell that is made up of solid zinc aqueous copper, and then ends up with aqueous zinc and solid copper. So, 
the first thing that we need to see here is we need to see that there are two substances present that do not change. What I mean by substances that do not change is that if we look here, we see that we start with zinc, copper that has a valency of 2, sulfate has a valency of 2, and that ends up as copper, zinc with a valency of 2, and sulfate still with a valency of 2. So the fact that sulfate has not changed makes us call it a spectator ion. It is a spectator ion because it has not taken part in the reaction. It has essentially just watched. Now what we can do, technically even without consulting our table of reduction potentials, is we can see who has undergone oxidation and who has undergone reduction. Right? Zinc over here has gone from being neutral to being positively charged, which means that zinc has clearly been oxidized. Zinc has given off two electrons. We can see that copper, starting out as an iron Cu2+, plus, has ended as a solid Cu2+, plus, plus two electrons, therefore it has been reduced. We can back this up by checking table 4b. We can check on table 4b and we find that zinc does occur closer to the top than copper. What this means is that the spontaneous way for this reaction to happen is with zinc being oxidized and copper being reduced. The reason I say this is because it is not always going to be the case where we give you the entire reaction equation. We could ask you, we could say, here is a reaction that occurs between zinc and copper. How must it be set up so that it is a spontaneous cell? In which case, you look at your table of reduction potentials, you find out which one of them is more easily oxidized, that one must be closer to the top, you find which one is more easily reduced, that one is closer to the bottom. Once we've done this, the rest of this is fairly straightforward. Because what we can now say is we say, clearly, I am starting with a solid zinc electrode. Right? Starting with zinc in its solid form. I am also starting with copper ions. We know that when it's in solution, when it says it's aqueous, that means that the ions are separate from each other. Starting with copper ions. The reason why these two have to be separated is because I want my one half reaction to happen over here. I want the other half reaction to happen over here so that there is an automatic transfer of electrons from one to the other. Because in doing that, I can then plug in a light bulb or a switch or whatever I want to use that electrical energy. Right, so what's important to remember here is that zinc is going to be oxidized, which automatically makes this the anode. When zinc is oxidized, it forms zinc ions that are no longer solid. So every zinc atom that is oxidized forms a zinc ion in solution. Those electrons are then attracted towards this electrode. The reason for that is because they've heard that copper is here looking for electrons. So the electrons land up on this electrode where they attract the copper electrode, the copper ion. So the copper ion go and stick on that electrode and they undergo reduction there, which makes this our cathode. So our reduction half reaction is going to be forming copper. Then what's important to remember here is that in any electrical circuit, we need a complete circuit. This isn't possible because we cannot just have electrons flowing in that direction forever because that would mean that eventually this would end up completely negative and this would end up completely positive and the electrons wouldn't want to go. So we need to complete the circuit with something called a salt bridge where salt here refers to any compound that is made up of a metal and a non-metal, 
Um, very often it is going to be potassium nitrate, it could be potassium sulfate, it could be sodium nitrate, anything that is a salt. The reason why that's important is because the salt is made up of positive and negative ions. So what that allows us to do is as the copper ions leave solution here, so we start out with a lot of copper ions in that solution, as they deposit themselves onto this electrode, the concentration of copper ions there decreases, while the sulfate remains the same, which means that we start to have an imbalance of charge because there's now more negative charge than positive charge on this side of the circuit. At the same time that that's happening, we've got sulfate in the solution, at the same time as that's happening, we've got the zinc ions in this solution, concentration continually increasing. Again, that's happening because every time a zinc atom loses its electron, zinc ions go into solution. So this side of the circuit becomes increasingly more positive. So what we do is we install the salt bridge so that the side of the circuit that's becoming negatively charged can be neutralized by the positive ions in the salt. The side of the circuit that's becoming positively charged can be neutralized by the negative ions in the salt. So, a common question is, what is the function or what is the purpose of the salt bridge? It is twofold. Number one, it must complete the circuit. Right? It must provide a complete path for charge to move around that circuit. And function number two, it maintains electrical neutrality. Right? So what it does is, because there's a whole lot of electrons heading over to this side, it doesn't want that side of the circuit to become negative. So positive charge goes that way to maintain neutrality. This side, because we're losing electrons that are into at risk of becoming positively charged, so what we do is we send some negative charge over here to maintain that neutrality. The result of this is that we have now created, using chemicals, a flow of electrical energy. Right? We've done this because we know that zinc does not want its electrons as badly as copper does. Meaning that zinc is easily oxidized, copper is easily reduced, so those electrons are pulled across to copper in a spontaneous reaction. While that's happening, the mass of this electrode is going to increase. Right? Every time a copper atom sticks onto it, it gets heavier. Right? So we are slowly coating this electrode in copper. At the same time, the mass of this electrode is going to decrease because every time zinc gives away its electron, it stops being an atom and becomes an ion and floats around in the solution. Right? The other thing that comes up quite often, so we're often asked about the mass of the electrodes. We can see that the cathode is always going to increase in mass, the anode is going to decrease in mass. We can see that the concentration of zinc ions <coughs> is going to increase concentration of copper ions is going to decrease. And then finally, because we've now created a battery, it's important for us to know which is the positive side and which is the negative side. And so we do that by seeing that the electrons are going from this side to this side. The electrons are negatively charged. They would always go from the negative side to the positive side. And in case that's too difficult for you, you can just remember that the cathode is always positively charged. A little bit of magic right there. And that is your basic setup for a galvanic cell. So, the basic setup for a galvanic cell always requires the same kind of setup. We always place each electrode in a solution of its own ions. What that means is that we put a zinc electrode in a solution of zinc ions. We put a copper electrode in a solution of copper ions. Next, we connect the two electrodes with the salt bridge. And as we said, that salt bridge has two purposes. The one is to maintain electrical neutrality. The other is to complete the circuit. A simpler way in which we represent a cell is called cell notation, or standard cell notation. And what we do with that is we always show the anode, meaning the anode electrode, First. So in this case, we said that our anode was a piece of zinc. So we say this is zinc solid. We then 
draw a vertical line. The vertical line is there to distinguish a phase difference between this solid and then the anode electrolyte, which we said was zinc sulfate, that is aqueous. What we then do to show that that is completely separate from what follows is we draw a double vertical line. That double line represents the salt bridge. That is then followed by the cathode electrolyte solution. In this case, that was copper sulfate, again aqueous. And finally, that is then the cathode electrode, which is copper in its solid form. The last thing that's important for us to be able to do here is to be able to determine the potential that one of these cells is capable of generating. The reason why we want to do this is because when we are trying to construct batteries, you would like to be able to construct a battery that provides the greatest potential difference possible. So we do that by looking at the standard cell potential. Standard cell potentials are given on table 4B, where it explains exactly what the potential is of that reaction happening. This is all done in reference to a hydrogen electrode. Now the reason why this is necessary is because, as we said right at the start, half reactions cannot occur in isolation. So in order for us to be able to measure the potential of one reaction, we need to measure it against something else. So we decided that we're going to call hydrogen the midpoint, and we're going to compare everything's reactivity with that of hydrogen. So what we did is we, you plug a hydrogen half cell, which is a gaseous half cell with a platinum electrode, into every single other electrode, that being zinc, copper, etc. And you measure the direction of current flow, and you measure the increase in concentration or mass of that electrode. And that way you can tell whether something is going to be reduced or oxidized more easily than the hydrogen electrode. Either way, what we end up with is a formula for our cell reaction, or our cell potential, that says that the cell potential at standard conditions, this symbol over here, means standard conditions. Standard conditions refer to the temperature, the concentration, and the pressure of those cell potentials. To be more specific, standard conditions mean that all liquids must be present in a concentration of one mole per cubic decimeter. The temperature must be at 25 degrees Celsius, and it must be at one atmosphere pressure. The reason why this is important is because as we learned in rates of reaction, when you change any of those factors, you are going to change the way in which this reaction takes place. So we always use standard cell potential where we say that the cell potential is always going to be that of the potential of the cathode minus the potential of the anode. In a spontaneous cell, the cell potential is always going to be positive or greater than zero. And in a non-spontaneous cell, it is always going to be less than zero. The last thing that we will find here is that as you leave this cell over time, because your iron or your anode is decreasing in mass, because your copper iron concentration is decreasing, the reaction is going to slow down. And since the reaction slows down, your cell potential will decrease. So what you find is that over time, the cell potential of any cell will decrease because of all those factors that affect any rate of reaction. The last thing that's important to understand is very briefly just what exactly makes up a standard hydrogen half cell. And it is very simply because hydrogen is a gas, because hydrogen is a gas, the only way that we can make it make contact with the circuit is by bubbling that gas onto a platinum electrode. The reason for that is platinum is called a contact catalyst because it essentially traps the hydrogen molecules and allows for a transfer of electrons to take place. So if you see a cell potential or a cell notation that says this, platinum, comma, hydrogen. That does not mean it is a platinum half cell. What that means is it is a hydrogen half cell with a platinum catalyst. 